Is this going to be else? This is it? Okay, Sometimes there's, more people there's, there's need to drink. I'll give you 15 minutes, then, mm -hmm. but, but you can start. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you for coming here today. I hope I have something to share with you. Um, Mike Kordinenko has asked me to talk to you about questions regarding the lab management. And he wanted me to talk about those which are pretty much oriented on postdocs and transition into faculty. And I guess I may have some, some comments on this. So feel free to leap in at any point in time. I'm Steve Alexander. I'm in Seoul. I'm like in cellular physiology. I've been there for um, 18 years, and I, in that time, I probably had eight or nine postdocs. So I have some experience interacting with postdoctoral fellows. I try, I try to be helpful to uh, fellows as much as I can. Um, they're sitting here in the audience. They can they can chime in. Yeah, and say <laughs> no way. Um, so there are several questions that were brought up, I see. And the first one is, you're a postdoc and have your own money for research. Let's say that you successfully competed for CCFA or an American Heart or an NSF, and money comes into you. So that money is awarded to you under the supervision of you and your quote unquote mentor. So there's a, there's a, a fair agreement between you and the university and your mentor, that, the, that everything will be spent equitably. So here it says, what would be a fair share for reagents, animals, and travel? How many, how many people in the audience are using animals in their studies? Everybody? No? OK, so I can tell you, animals can eat up an enormous amount of your budget if you're doing animal-based studies. If you if you do use animals, um, the amount that is charged for each box of animals at the university can add up extremely quickly. If you're going to use animals, it's really a good idea to use them and be done with them. Um, animals that are maintained in breeding colonies will very quickly add to the collection of animals that you can have. I would say for uh, BJ's project and for Ping's project, we are currently paying somewhere between eight and nine hundred dollars per month for um, some of these animals to be maintained. In some cases, you know, some cases you have animals that are just coming in. For example, Ping's project is using animals that we just order, and then we so the big cost there is getting the animals in, and these these knockouts are. $200 a piece, cool. very high. On the other hand, BJ is not ordering, we're, we're making some of the animals for some of his projects. That cost about, that cost about seven, $8,000 to generate those animals. And then the, they're fairly slowly breeding, so that's going to be um, much more limited. Um, on the other hand, if you're using wild type animals, it costs between $20 and $25 a piece. You bring those in and use those within a fairly short amount of time. That's not going to run you as much. Of course, more long-term studies are going to increase the cost. But animals can be an, an incredibly large portion of a budget. Um, besides that, a fair share for reagents. This is all going to be project specific. Ideally, you will want to try to keep your animal budget as modest as possible, define it as much as possible. You will be, these days it's becoming increasingly restricted as to how much and what you can do with your animals within the protocol. We used to be able to administer a drug to an animal just, you know, you could change a drug, you could change an anesthetic. Now we're all, you're, you're all aware of this, right? That we're completely restricted. You can't change a drug, you can't change it. I think you can change a dose, but you still have to submit a modification, and then it has to go out for a review of two to three weeks, which adds up the, t the amount of time. So your protocol has to be so much more extensive these days than it ever had to be before. So you could consider out of a $75,000 a year, let's consider there are some intramural awards here that we get that come up to about $75,000 a year. Of that, 
postdoc is between thirty-five to forty-two thousand dollars a year salary, depending on um, the stage in your career, and that leaves the balance for reagents, travel, etc. <clears throat> travel is usually going to be fixed. A lot of agencies, and intramurally, it's fixed. Um, now I think it's up to uh, two thousand. It's it's var it's varied, and I checked with our business manager on this. It's varied from fifteen hundred to two thousand, but she told me um, two thousand a year for travel is typical. Now, um, go ahead, go ahead. So if you're don't pay attention. Don't pay attention. You know, registration for meetings is going up tremendously. You can have to allow four to five hundred dollars per re for registration for some meetings. International meetings are going to be even higher. When you get to those meetings, I know uh, Dr. Gante and I uh, went to a meeting, and then two days of the meeting. Um, well, at least a day and a half of the meeting, you had to pay additional fees for classes. So you get to the meet, you have to, you have to really study the brochures for these things. Because you'll get there and be, well, additional sessions are 150 each, or meet the, you know, meet the lecturer is an additional $75. And sometimes these things are very useful in networking, okay? For reagents, um, everything else that you have there is available for reagents, and that's going to vary. I, I don't even I don't even claim to know to begin where we would talk about reagents. Reagents can be very inexpensive. Reagents can be very very expensive. If you have a bit, okay, um, as my lab knows, I'm extremely cheap. I always try and do everything economically. We we buy things when we have to. If we don't have to buy something though, we're making it, we're borrowing it, we're sharing it, and it's good to collaborate with people who already have things, you will save yourself enormous amounts of money if there is a reagent that is already there. It's worth sending out a global email. It's good to do a search. We have found so many cell types. I did a global search for HL1 cells at, at LSU, and I found that there were at least three people who had those cells. Some cells you will have to buy from ATCC, some cells, and, and does anyone know how, how much does a cell line cost? Anyone? $300? That's the bottom. Some cell lines are going to be up to like $600 a piece. Can you share those? Can you share those cells with your neighbors? Can you share the cells with? Anyone? Can you share the cells? Yeah? No way! You can't share those cells. Who can you share them with? Like if you get cells and you want to share them with me. Oh, with you? No, you won't share the cells. <laughs> <laughs> That's the right answer. Jim. Okay. The deal is, if if you are if you are sharing the cells out, that person has to recognize formally, either through an agreement that you are on the paper or someone in your lab is acknowledged for it, or it has to be a, it has to be an official collaboration on it. If you just give some cells to someone. Nine times out of ten, you're going to be in violation of material transfer agreement if there is one that exists for that. You can't do that. If you send cells out to somebody, you're going to put yourself at risk and put the university at risk. If you're going to share it out, find out what are the conditions of this. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually now a big deal. I was going through all the MTA, the material transfer agreements that I have for cells in my lab, and the stack is this thick. And, you know, I have a really seriously. I, I used to I used to share cells out freely. It's like, oh, we made the cells. It's like, oh no, I can't do that. And, but if you can, if you can get cells from someone. You'll save yourself enormous amounts of reagents, and enormous amounts of time in generating these things. Adnos, look around. People will freely share adnos. My gosh, how much money you can save from from doing something like that. So reagents, animals, travel. I think travel, um, how many meetings, who goes to one meeting a year? Here. Who goes to two meetings a year? Three meetings a year? Or are, we, or are people not going to any meetings a year? Are you going to zero meetings a year? Okay. Find out if there's travel money available from, um, from the department, from the school. Uh, I think if you, get, if you get money, let's say that you have, if you have, an opportunity. I'd split the money up. Try and try and get as many meetings out of it as you can a year. 
It's the only opportunity we have for travel that's free, and it's a very good opportunity for networking with other with other people. How are we doing? Wait. Wait. He's, way. he's in the way. Okay, he's on the way. Okay. So then let's say that you're extremely productive, as I know all of you are. You're extremely prolific. You write good papers, send them out to good journals, apply for funding at granting agencies, and you get funded. Okay, then you're looking for starting up your own lab, as I expect all of you will be pretty soon. Then you're making the transition from uh, junior faculty or, or um, pre-faculty to faculty, your initial faculty positions. So then, whenever you come to an institution and you get, you get money, there's going to be some startup funds around that. So, um, are you aware of how much startup funds are these days? Mm, no. no. Well, no. I have an idea. You have an idea? Sort of. I'm curious what your idea is. <laughs> uh, I don't want to call the name of the institution, but as far as I know, it's uh, $300,000 for as much time as you can stretch it for. Okay, and is that is that a local institution or? As far as I know, it's here. As far as you know, it's here. It's not. That's not too. That's not too far afield. Um, actually, that figure is actually on the low side. I know. A little. I know. It's a little bit on the low side. Play it back. Back in the day when when I first got here, it was under a hundred. But the prices so, were different, right? The prices were not that different. <laughs> I mean, the prices were different, yes. But I mean, prices weren't like four times different, like three times different. I mean, a, a tube of antibody didn't used to be $50 or $75 a tube. It used to be, you know, in my you know, everything goes up. But yeah, that's true. The startup funds that you would be expecting at most institutions would at least be Three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand at a lot. Uh, a lot of institutions of more uh, uh, more high cost regions of the United States, East Coast, West Coast. Those are going to be higher, and you're going to be expected to. But I mean, you get three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand dollars here because here the costs. Believe it or not, the costs of living here figure into that because if you're going to pay for someone and pay for things, well, your reagent's costs are going to be the same wherever. But paying somebody here, you may be able, you know, postdoc salaries and faculty salaries and um, maintenance is going to be higher at some institutions. So you may get, you go to Harvard, you may get more. Um, you may get, um, you may get less at smaller institutions. And you're going to have to negotiate very hard to get every possible penny that you can. So you want to get a list of your justifications as to what you're going to need. You need specific pieces of equipment. You, you need to pay, and we're going to talk a little bit, you're going to need to pay postdocs, you need to pay technicians, you need to pay graduate students. Um, you're going to make, need to maintain a mouse colony and buy all of these things, pay for all the publications that you're going to score. Um, go to meetings and network with people. So, how long can you use that money for? How long is your startup money good for? You only good for a short amount. I think for your until you get tenure, no? Yeah, it's it's good. It's good pretty much until whenever. As long as you can stretch it out, and you want to stretch that out because that's your money until you get a grant. And if you come in. If you're lucky enough to come in without a grant, and we, you know, we frequently look at people. Is it freezing cold in here? Yeah. Good. Okay. So, so if no, uh, well, I mean, yeah. freezing yeah. Iceland. Yeah. Freezing <laughs> Iceland. Come on. So, until you get a grant, that's your that's your money. So you want to maintain as modest a burn rate on that money as you can possibly maintain. I think that's that's why I'm so I'm so cheap. One of the reasons is because I, I had so little to work with. I, I really I really just bled that out as long as I could. And I think I, I think I did fairly well on it. But if you're if you're clever you can make that money last a long time. Now after that, um, let's say what 
what are the rates of successful NIH grants this year? 8%. 8%. And so that, NIH and NIAID is 8%. 8%. That's about right. That means that of 10 grants that are submitted, not one, 0.8 of those grants is going to be approved. So that means you're really going to have to be very economical with the money that you get. So there are always other opportunities for, you know, when you come in, you would have to plan, I am not getting my first, my first submission on my NIH grant, and maybe not my second. So I'm going to have to keep my lab running on fumes, basically your startup funds, and then you're going to have to look at intramural, intramural funding. As soon as you, as soon as you get um, a postdoc, a postdoctoral fellow or a graduate student, I would right away see if, if, if you're not funded, okay, I would immediately ask them to be thinking about and writing for external extramural funding your extramural funding that is going to be available from American Heart Association, for example, can be anywhere from uh, 30 to 40 percent, and that's good. That means that means you have a pretty good shot at that. Graduate student making 25, 26 thousand dollars a year. Um, if that burn rate is coming out of your startup, then you are going to want to have. If you can save that money, that's an awful lot of money a year. And typically, these these graduate awards can be. For two years, and that saves you. That saves you fifty thousand dollars. That's out of four hundred, four hundred thousand dollars. That's a significant chunk. And postdoc even more. Supply money. I mean, you get an American Heart Association award um, or a CCFA. You can be up anywhere from uh, seventy-five to one hundred thousand uh, dollars plus. That that can that can add to it, and that will buy you several more years, and during which time you're getting more pubs in, you're strengthening your position, and submitting those grants. Just keep submitting those grants. I can't, I can't stress this enough. That's, that's, um, it's, it's the most disheartening thing you're going to ever have to do, is to send in papers and send in grants and have them hammered and come back. And um, if, you get, if you get disheartened, that's that's going to uh, narrow the pool for everybody else. You just got to keep sending it back in and sending it back in and sending it back in. Papers will go in eventually. Grants will get funded eventually. It's all just a matter of time. So keep, keep, going, keep going for that. Um, <clears throat> are there any restrictions on what you can spend startup funds on? As far as I know and I check, you can spend your startup funds on personnel, travel, anything. That's a very dangerous position to be in with your money if you have a lot of money and you can spend it on anything. Well, then you're going to spend it on anything and then your burn rate will be very high. Limit it, keep it, you know, try and find it any other way. The last thing you should do is to spend that, spend that money because if you've got this nest egg, it doesn't grow, it's only dwindling. You get it and you, and you, you hold it close to your heart and you make sure that you've used it for the best possible. Um, funds that you get. How negotiable is startup? <clears throat> if you come into a department and you have got a, a high number of high impact publications or at least have a high number of publications and you're working in an interesting and potentially fundable field, you may, you may be able to command more, um, more money. What are the strategies that departments will use to say well, you don't need so much startup. Well, if I were a department chairman and I were going and I were interviewing someone and they said, well, I need $400,000, you could say, well, wait, hold on there. You don't need $400,000. What do you need it for? Well, I need it for a microscope. Well, we've got microscopes here. Uh, we've got, got a mouse colony that is, that is taken care of. Are we using some? I don't know. I think so. <laughs> they're, they're, they're setting, they're setting my, oh. my discourse to music. So they'll try, they'll try and, you know, uh, department chairmen aren't made out of money either, so they're going to try and find reasons and things, and within reason. I mean, someday all of you will be chairmen, chairwomen, chairpersons somewhere, and you're going to be negotiating people who are going to want to come in and they're, they're going to want the moon. And if people come in 
and there are already existing labs. Lab space is negotiable. Funding is going to be negotiable. And there, you know, this is always going to be an important negotiation. And you must not. You must think of it as an active negotiation. I don't know if you're all comfortable with that, but you better be prepared to say no, or I don't think so, or I'll think about that, or well, here's my position on it. And you really have to wrangle over this. Because you're only going to get to negotiate lab space and start up one time. After that, that's it. And it's worthwhile finding out what is the southern regional average. Example, if you live in the south, what is the southern regional average for um, faculty salaries? Um, what is the cost of living? Um, these, are, these are things that really are going to figure in very prominently. You need to look at demographics. You know, things you may not be thinking about um, when you're, you know, you think purely scientifically, you may, you may be missing out on some of the things that you need to um, be negotiating on. Do you have any questions at this, at this point? Should we just keep talking? Okay. What about equipment? What about equipment? Perfect, sorry. Uh, that's, that's a major example of something that someone may say, well, okay. Well, we've got microscopes. Well, I need a special microscope. Or we have a core. Well, if you have this core, do I get a special break-in price? Do you, everything's negotiable. Don't think that anything is not negotiable. Are you going to have to share equipment with someone? How much is how much is the maintenance on that equipment? Do you need to contribute to a maintenance contract for equipment? How many people would get to use it? How many hours a week would I be able to get to use it? And if those things don't add up, and you may need to have your very own dedicated piece of equipment. Yeah, equipment, equipment can be the biggest chunk of anyone's, anyone's budget. What about, have you ever heard of, of you know, like unreasonable uh, demands and startup funding from people that want to join a faculty? You know, what kind of a, only from unemployed people. Yes. Uh, unreasonable, unreasonable startup. Um, sure. It, it depends on what level you're coming in at. Let's say that you are okay. Because some of the lighter questions that Mike came up with for this anticipated it. Let's say that you are coming from a lab. You trained in a lab and you had all this equipment. And um, well, in order to do your thing, you're going to need to have. X, Y, and Z pieces of equipment, mm -hmm. and um, you need to have the most newfangled spinning disc confocal laser heat seeking microscope in order to do your your studies. It's debatable. Now, once you've made once you've made that request. Um, and you say, okay, I need an extra two hundred thousand dollars. So I have to get this microscope. Do you think that you? Do you believe that you are required? What if you don't buy that microscope? Then are you in? Are you in violation of an agreement? Okay, I need this. I need this money for equipment. Then you don't buy the equipment. And use it on the salary. What do you think? Can you do that? No, I don't think so. I think you don't think so. At least if it's a part of, of you your. You can or not, but you're not going to make any friends. If it is not in a contract. Your justification? Yeah. So once that thing, once that's set, I mean, whatever you negotiate, yeah. the, now they will get they will get annoyed at you on that. Now, if you come in, if you come in and somebody came in and said, "Well, I want 550," and. Um, you come in and say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to need, okay, that's, that's one thing. You may say, I need, I need equipment. Or I may need, um, I may need salary support for a state funded technician or an institutional funded technician because um, I, I'm going to need, I'm going to need additional support until, until I can get independent funding. Yeah, people will come in and say that. Will you lose the position, or will you lose the offer as a result of having made too firm a position? I think you'll already you'll already know. Um, you you should have a fairly good idea about what is going to be offered. They're gonna they're gonna lowball you um, always. 
you always have to you always have to try and negotiate that. I would never I would never assume that um, a chairman is going to offer me as high as they are willing to go. Uh, how how much higher are you willing are you willing to case in case in point, when I was an assistant professor I went to Georgia Tech and um, I had I had my R twenty one, I had a first award, which was a pretty good award at that time. It was like one of the it was one of these initial grants. And I went in expecting that I was going to get like, I thought I was going to get like uh, 150 or so at the time. That was, that was what was the going rate. And I went in and they said, do you want to start up? I said, yeah, I want to start up. I want to start a lab. How am I supposed to start a lab? And they said, well, you don't need any of that. We have tissue culture facilities right here. You can just use them. How many of you would like to walk in and use somebody else's tissue culture facility? No, we'll give you a shelf. <laughs> Ridiculous. And uh, I, went, I, I also interviewed at the Skirbel Center at uh, NYU in New York, and they said, "Yeah, we'll give you, we'll give you startup. We'll give you fifty thousand dollars in startup." I'm like fifty thousand dollars in startup. Big institutions figure, well, we have our pick of whoever we want. So if you want to come, we're not offering, we're, we're not offering you so much. This is why we're in a good place. LSU is a good, really good balance of, um, you can come in, there's, there's intramural money, we are, we are well supported by the state. You come in here, it's a good standard of living. Um, so I think we're in a, we're in a location that has a, a, a good balance. Um, People are not quite so proud here as to offer you nothing. There is good intramural support from the institution. There's nice facilities. I have had very good opportunities for collaborating with lots of other different labs. I'm sure you all see a great deal of collaboration that goes on here. I don't know. I, I don't know what your experience has been, but here, I think, we collaborate with a lot of different labs. In our department, outside of our department, there's a lot of people working together. That saves money. It's good for, it's good for getting exposure to different technologies and what people have. Um, Dr. Gore brought up an excellent point. If you have, have $400,000 and you, you have, you know, all this money is in there, do you need to have a tabletop ultra centrifuge? Well, of course you don't. You want to use big ticket items? Forget it. I would always look to see, and all, all departments maintain a list of equipment that is running. And you want to make sure that that equipment is in fact running, because they'll say, oh yeah, we've got a freeze dryer. It hasn't worked for four years, but we've got, we've got one. I don't know. Um, you know, you want to make sure that these things really are there, but what's available, what you... They can also be repaired. And it can be repaired. Really nice yeah. And we'll try and repair something that they just have a little glitch there. I've seen them do that. They work really hard. You, you will go far. You will go far. You will, you're, you're cheap. I, 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 I definitely am feeling that. Um, you go, it, I, have seen, <coughs> I have seen the folly of spending money on the Rolls Royce of refrigerators, freeze dryers, microscopes, hoods. You get the, the newest, most beautiful $18,000 tissue culture hood when, when the old one that was in the lab already would have done just fine. This is, this is, this is, su this is professional suicide. You want to, you want to, because your, your money is most importantly spent on, what's the most important thing to spend money on? People. People. Postdocs. I, I think technicians are great. I would, I would take a postdoc most, most of the time because Postdocs are dedicated to the projects. They want to. They want to get publications out, or or should. And most of them, most postdocs will publish as much as they possibly can. And the technician will do the ordering and everything. But they're not. They they don't have the same drive or commitment. I mean, they don't have the commitment for. I mean, if they publish, it's nice. But most important thing is postdocs. And, you train, you train as many postdocs as you can, because you're in it. You're in it. I mean, you're 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 in it together 
you succeed, the postdoc succeeds, you put, uh, you put as many things out as, as possible, and I think that's, that's the most important. As opposed, you know, maybe, maybe when you get to be, um, of course, productivity and impact, there's, there's a lot of people will tell you that, um, well, it's really, it's, it's really the impact factor. That's, that's really true. You should be shooting for the highest impact factor and the greatest number of publications. But if you have one high impact type, one high impact paper versus having several decent impact uh, factor papers, you know, it looks like people can see your productivity with more publications. I would never, I would never say, you know, don't don't publish. Then again, um, too many too many low impact. Um, I've never I've never seen people dis discount the number of publications. Um, if you're publishing in science, that's great. If you're publishing in JI, that's great. If you're publishing in American Journal of Physiology, that's still pretty that's still pretty good. Um, the, the, the number of papers that you can get out for your group is going to get the biggest uh, amount of... Are you laughing? No. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, it's, going to make, it's just going to be the, the name that you get out there. And the more that you get out, uh, the better recognized you're going to be. Okay. Um, how negotiable with startup. How should you distribute your startup for your first year as faculty time-wise? Not exactly I mean, how do you divide your time? No. Probably didn't formulate it really well. And the point was... So like how much first year? Yeah. First so year. you get, let's say, 400,000. Let's say you get... What should you expect to spend in the first year? And reasonable. Because yeah, you can never predict what you need. I mean, you can predict, but you can to predict what you need to a certain better, extent, right? You better predict. You better. You should. Okay, if you're looking, if you're looking at getting a job, you should be saying, okay, here's my here's my lab. In my lab, I have what? Here's the postdoc. Here's the centrifuge. You know, you need to know what you are going to need to run an experiment. You go. You go. What do you touch in a day? What are you, what are you actually going to need? You need all. You can need. Um, Anything that is anything that is essential, you should find out. Do they already have it, or are you going to actually need to have one? You're not going to go to if you're doing tissue culture. You're not going to need a, 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 a fancy centrifuge, and you're not going to go to somebody else's lab. You need to have your own, you need to have your own hood and incubator. Those are essential. Now, do you need you need a microscope? Are you going to need to have a cell sorter? Are you going to need access to facts? Um, where is it done? How much do they charge? How, you know, look at the previous, because the, the year you get there, you're going to be doing exactly the same thing that you did the year before. What did you need? So if you're looking at a job, what are you using this year? You're going to need exactly the same. You can't, if there's a new technology that comes up, you're not, you can't anticipate that. Whatever you did this year, you're going to do next year too. So whatever you, whatever, whatever pieces of equipment you, use this year, you'll need the exact same thing next year. You have to you have to Xerox that lab that you're in and then say, okay, what's the cheapest thing that I don't need? Or what do I absolutely have to have you new? Know, a microscope loses a light bulb, you change it, it's good forever. I mean forever. And you know, I used to schlep around my old, old tissue culture microscopes that I just borrowed from my for my uh, my old mentor until they eventually got replaced by newer things that people just cast off. And we had a lot of we had a lot of cast off stuff. Is there something that we is there something that we that we need that we should get? I'm directing this to Dr. Gonda. It's like is there, what is the what is the one thing that we need that we don't have? I can't think of I don't know. What we do, we're pretty in much good. Basis, we are pretty much good. What we're doing, we're pretty much good. Um, we rely on individual expertises. Uh, we, we, have, we have our talents, and we make those talents work for the reagents and the mice and uh, the models that we have. So that relies, we're not relying on um, 
a chip reader that we that we would have to have or some special technology. You become dependent on a special technology. Um, it goes with all the costs that are associated with that. You pick an expensive technology, you're gonna you're gonna be paying for whatever is associated with it. Um, how should you distribute your first years as a as a as a faculty time wise? Let's move that. Get out covered. Time wise, get out the previous publications that you haven't gotten out yet. Finish your pubs. Get everything. Get everything out. If you can't get it into the highest journal, back off. Send it somewhere else. Just get it out. How many people have dead publications sitting sitting in their outbox? Holy cow! Oh my gosh! I'm guilty of this. I got a lot. I got a lot, but but I feel bad about it. And I'm going to get those out. And we we gradually get them out. And it is a matter of excretion. That is moving it from the inside to the outside. And if you don't get that out, it never met, it never happened. So just get it out so, somewhere and beat on your mentor to get those things out because they're busy and they want to get it out, but has to get out. Have to get your have to get your papers out. So spend your first finish what you started, get those get those papers out. And have have um, I would say it's not dedication, but um, discipline yourself to finish the finish those papers. Um, next, oh my gosh, uh, find I know that Chris Campbell talked to you about grants. Find out about special opportunity awards that are available for people in their early years. Do not. Some of these opportunities are only going to be available within a certain amount of time after getting your PhD. So there's a there's a window of opportunity for newbies, like like people who are only a few years out from their PhD. And then when you get past that, those won't those won't be available. So find out what is what is available in your field and hit them right away. Start blanketing and send in as many grants as you can. <coughs> Extramurally, extramurally. Unless you're unless you unless you're funded. If you're funded, great. If not, you've got to be sending in you've got to be sending in grants, and it's going to prepare you because um, as we've all picked this insane job where you have to beg. Anyone listen to NPR, National Public Radio? Once in a while. Once in a while. So you know they're begathons. So this is what you do professionally. You're a, you're a professional beggar asking for money. Of some granting agency that's going to give you give you money, so you become a, a professional beggar, and you better get good at it fast. So you better start begging, beg early, often, and effectively. Um, start sending in, start sending in grants right away. Start sending in your papers right away. Um, training graduate students. I'd still go. I'd go for I go early years. I would go straight for a postdoc, especially for a postdoc. Postdoc because you're so close to your postdoc when you're when you're young faculty. I get a postdoc in because you're, you're working together. You, you have you have that postdoc energy, and you're both you have fairly more common more common goals. Um, I'd hire I'd hire a postdoc mo most of the time if I if I. I really could. Postdocs are going to cost more money. Yes. A couple of questions regarding yeah. postdocs versus uh, research associates. So postdoc is postdoc going to cost you more money? Because as far as I know, for research associate, you have to pay some other fees. Some I'm, I'm not familiar with all the HR regulations, but it's something like for the postdoc, you pay him, you pay him salary. And that's it. Mm -hmm. For research associate, you pay fringe benefits. So the total is comparable? Uh, no. A postdoc no? is postdoc is almost always going to be cheaper. Cheaper? Uh, think of it think of it this way. A post uh, NIH NIH standard um, is going to be anywhere from thirty-eight to forty-five depending on uh, how many years out you are. If you get a technician, the lowest end here lowest end of a technician is about 30, and then you have to pay about 33% for 
fringe on top of that. Which makes it 40. Which makes it 40. Um, so the lowest end, lowest end person, but they're not, they're not trained either. And they don't. You mean a research associate? A research associate, maybe a research associate that comes in at 30 is somebody fresh out of college who's taken chemistry and biology and you know, you're gonna have to show them everything. Postdoc comes in, they're like, where's the lab? Okay, where are the cells? Okay, I need to make up reagents and they're well, that's the best case stuff. scenario. That's the best case scenario. I'm it sure happens five percent. I mean, come on, everybody <laughs> in this room, I could I could say, okay, we're in a Western blood. Everyone here can go and run it and they can they I can have publish no it. Idea. <laughs> <laughs> well that's not that's but, not true. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> let's let's say but that they could. Yeah, theoretically, maybe. He knows, well. Can you pH a solution? You know, yeah. who is, who is? Like poor, and I can do flow cytometry. Yeah, <laughs> okay, okay. okay. But no, let, me, let, me, let me say this. In this room, I think nobody has less than, I don't know, three, four years of real strong research lab experience. Right. I know. I'm not talking about postdoctoral experience. Okay. I'm talking about okay. research lab so, experience. Okay, so hold, hold this thought. How much are you going to pay for a technician-wise for someone with the equivalent amount of experience? Yeah, that's right. That's going to be you're going to be paying at least fifty. Seriously? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, in our department in physiology, we have people who are at the upper end of their field, and they're making eighty k a year, or seventy seventy eighty k a year as as research associates. And so they don't. They're, they're, they're so well trained. And they've been around for 20 years. They're, they're at the top of their game. But you're going to pay a lot of money for somebody like that. Somebody who's been around for four years is still going to be, you know, they're, they're going to peg out but at, at, a, at a particular level. But, I mean, but are, you, are you going to be lucky enough to get that person? Can you afford that person? Would no. you want to afford that person out of your startup money? <laughs> no. Not me. I'm going to get a good postdoc who wants to publish, publish, publish. I'm going to say, here, I'm just going to drop them on, on a couple of projects to say, go for it. Then they'll be, they'll be more productive. You're going, to have to, you're, going to have to, you're going to have to drive that technician to do everything. You're going to say, I need you to do this. Postdoc is self-driven. Usually they go, okay, you know, what to, you know what's going to come next. You don't have to be told every next step. You know, research associate will get somewhere and usually stop. And then they have to, you know, they start. Continual. Mm -hmm. so, you said, yeah. You'd rather want a postdoc early on in your career than a graduate student. But can, for example, your department say when it hires you, and we expect you to take a graduate student? Or is that always up to the professor right away? I can't imagine you can Good always question. say no, no to a taking grad. I can't imagine that you can go through your whole career in a certain department without ever taking a graduate student. That's true. Let's say that you, the perfect example, um, your new faculty member haven't got a grant yet. You come in, you have $400,000 of startup. <clears throat> uh, the department says, we'd like you to take a graduate student. Um, can you say no? Maybe you could say no. You have, to, you have to think that you're going to be taking that graduate student for three, four years. That graduate student is going to eat up uh, $75,000 to $100,000 worth of salary alone, plus reagents. And if they're a dud, or unproductive, or if you, they they really like to play Tetris a lot, or whatever, um, that's going to be a that's going to be a major investment. Um, you should have some very serious uh, heart uh, soul searching to find out is that person really going to be a profitable? Uh, is it going to be good for you? Is it going to be good for them? If it's if you think that this person is going to be you know dynamic and really drive things forward quickly, great. If not, I would say, when I would tell my chairman, well, until I'm, until I'm funded, I really don't have money to take somebody on right now. I really have to focus on developing my lab. And, and you know, if, you're, if your money, if you're a year or two in, you could say, well, I can't take a graduate student because I don't know that I can pay them for full-time salary. Play out. Uh, I would always like to train graduate students, and if you can, that's that's great. Um, you are going to you, you are going to be a little bit um, self-serving the first few years. Uh, you you know, um, 
you can only you can help others by helping yourself. If you can't get your own if you can't get your own lab and your own program off the ground, then being really helpful to the department, what good is it going to do? If you go down, you know, if you go down, everybody goes down with you. If you take somebody after a year or two, after you get some funding, as soon as that or as soon as that funding is there, definitely take somebody. Or you could say, well, I have a student that's interested in this project, and I'm going to have them write a pre-doctoral award. And you get somebody to write a pre-doctoral award, they get it, then you know, then your commitment is reduced tremendously down to um, whatever the costs are for the remaining years, and then the reagents. So, okay, it's maybe a little bit off topic, but let's take it to the question of microbiology, where they always have, you know, at least. It strikes me was as, at least compared to physiology, they have tons of graduate students every year. So, but but I'm guessing that there must be pressure on young faculty to take this because I see that young faculty there they end up with graduate students. Can we turn that camera off for a second? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> uh, how to hire your first employee research associate versus graduate student versus postdoc? You can, you can you can study. Study. Yeah. I have another question regarding that. It may seem provocative. So let's say you hire a postdoc since it's it's a cheaper option, right? I'm not saying that you do it because it's the cheaper option. No, 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 option, okay. And, and, and let's option. put it this way. You hire the postdoc and it is a cheaper option. Mm -hmm. And then you find out that the postdoc, you know, it doesn't work out so well for you and for him and he can't work with you for any reason. Maybe he's lazy, maybe he just doesn't know anything or something like that. So you have to what hire... What do you do? You or you have to... You fire a person. You fire a person? Yeah. How does it work? You have X amount of time right? after they're initially hired. With regular employees you have... With regular employees here at the university you have a three month trial period. I think Technically, with postdocs, um, I don't think. Huh? You can. You can there, you know, you but I would. I, I don't know of anyone. I, I can't think of a condition under which you would let. I mean, it. It's. It's unconscionable. Somebody's committed so much. To, you know, you have. Well, to, what if it's not what? too much commitment? What if the postdoc actually sucked? But what, what Sorry you, about the language. I mean, you hire a person and it's not what you expect. But what about your contract, Steve? Suppose if you are taking a postdoc on a contract base for one year or two years and if you don't like him for the first three months or something, so can you fire no, the I, breach I, in the contract? I think you may... I think you may be able to, but... I don't, so I don't think I know of anyone who ever no, I did. So the conditions for RA and postdoc are different in firing them? Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate your, <laughs> what you know, position towards the postdocs that they should be treated. Well, I think with I, respect, I, I, you know, you're, yeah, you're, 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 you're most vulnerable. I mean, besides being a graduate student, you're, you're most vulnerable. This is a period where you have to be the most productive, publication-wise, um, anywhere. You're making you're making connections, and you're 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 trying to be as productive as possible and get your, your name known for a particular field. If that doesn't if that doesn't translate at that point into some form of productivity, um, you know, it's gonna be hard. Um, people who are not productive in their postdocs don't go extremely far. But if they are productive in their postdocs, they go, you know, they go happily into good positions and everything like that. So you you know I think everybody here knows that their their PIs want them. You know. Then again, if you're if none of your postdocs do well, you're a dud too. You know, you want your postdocs to go on to like good positions and do well. And I mean, if, if you don't, you're not doing your job either. Um, I don't know. I can't think of a I can't think of a situation under which you'd want to terminate them. I've seen postdocs leave and go to other labs, but that's very rare. Um, I don't know. So. No, I was just interested. Trying to think about. What can you take? Is it good? 
what can you take from your old lab? <laughs> <laughs> hey! <laughs> Under the, <laughs> under the cover of darkness. We'll talk <laughs> later. <laughs> no, I think after you say you can everything. Yeah. If you developed, if you developed uh, cell lines, you've got a right to them. You should check the university policy on that because it was developed with NIH funds. I think you should be entitled to take those cells with you. If you develop models, you should be entitled to take those models with you. Can you take your microscope? No. <laughs> can you take um, can you take reagents? If it's done with NIH funds, you're expected to share those reagents with anybody else who has NIH funds. Um, only with NIH too, or uh, actually or only with NIH. And I think you are not required to share it with. <coughs> Moscow, whatever, but you, but typically, I mean, everybody shows everything. Mm -hmm. Most people are pretty good about that. It's actually getting a little bit more restricted now, and I'm not very happy about that getting more restricted. Um, what else can you take? You know, um, while I would not care if someone were to want to take certain things with them, the university is our <coughs> university is very particular. Just had some faculty members leave and they wanted to take old, cruddy, crappy pieces of equipment with them. Refrigerators, just the ones that they knew that had been repaired three and four times. The university said, no, you can't have that. Or they'll have to pay the equivalent of a new one. Why they would want to hold on to, you know, for some depreciation purposes for their inventory, they may want to hang on to it. I don't know. What else can you take from your old lab? Um, Hmm? Projects. Oh, projects? Yeah, for sure. Um, work with your PI to come up with an equitable um, division of direction for, for these things. Um, I think you should expect to be able to continue working, working in the area in which you were already working. Uh, of course, you're not going to like go off in a completely new direction, although I did. I, I was working on lung, and then I came here and did some work on lung, and I started getting into the gut, and now we're doing work in the brain, and so I'm kind of, I'll go wherever there's money, which is, which is a good suggestion. Go where there is money. Find the money, go after, you know, find the cheese, get the money. You're all technically very adept. Use that to study things that will bring money into your laboratory. Um, be willing to, I mean, everything is interesting. Every disease is interesting. Every model is interesting. Go where you can keep your lab funded. You, as, our, as our president says, um, you have to be nimble these days. You have to be able to jump from one thing to another in order to keep, keep your operation going. I think that's, you should be willing to at least consider doing something like that. Um, if you study a model, if you, if you study one particular um, disease entity, um, or if you study a particular pathway, that pathway may be operating in diseases. And for those of you that don't study diseases, study diseases. So diseases are eminently fundable. Every disease, cancer, stroke, multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, arthritis, um, uh, peripheral vascular disease, anything that is clinically fundable, go after that. There is money, there is money there. Um, you will be more successful, at least if you have one direction that, that brings money in that way. Um, tips in lab management. Um, Just general ones. Hmm? Just general ones. God, you your... gotta maintain, you will, it, it's not like, these days, it's not like you need to maintain an inventory. You must maintain an inventory. We're required by the safety department to maintain um, MSDSs on everything that's in the lab and every every reagent. You, you know, it's really worthwhile keeping track of things like cells, reagents, antibodies, agreements. If you've got, you know. Doesn't sound like much now. Um, material 
material transfer agreements, confidentiality agreements, these are going to add up. You're going to have a bajillion of these. Um, keep, keep them in a binder. Keep them. Keep we them. Have a binder of papers yeah. from the seventies in it of for sales and that were given. Keep track of reagents that were given. God forbid you wind up publishing something and said, someone says, "You're supposed to have acknowledged me for for those for this that or the other thing." You know? I guess it goes both ways when you send something out to make sure you send like you know. A yeah, and that all has to be reviewed by. Says, that all has to be reviewed by. This is what I'm sending mm -hmm. you, and this is what I expect you to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and keep you keep these emails, all these emails in which you've made agreements with people. You can be sure that they're keeping emails of what they said to you, and by by all means, if you don't feel comfortable communicating something to someone or something is of a sensitive nature, do not email it and be be cautious about what you are emailing people because it's a permanent record. It will never go away. So if you have a phone conversation with someone and you make an agreement, um, that did not actually happen unless you need it to happen. And then you can say, just summarize on your phone call in which we discuss so and so and so and so. And uh, just you are okay in sending these cells to us, and we are allowed to do this with it. And they write back, yes, that's a contract. That is a contract that is admissible in court. So you got to make sure that you keep keep those things. Um, <coughs> electronic versus hard copy. Um, either way, um, electronic or, or hard copy. Do you need hard copies? Uh, you need you need hard copies. If the, if the electronic record is ever lost, it didn't happen. It's gone. <laughs> Oops. Um, no, the safety department actually asked because we tried to uh, do all our inventory electronic and they said we need to have hard copies. It's oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, have to have, you have to maintain both an electronic and a hard copy. You'll, you'll get good at that. There, there are programs that allow you to maintain these electronically. I don't. I, I don't use it, I just use an Excel spreadsheet. And, um, I don't know, what else? I, I think you have all made a good choice in getting into science. We do have good futures as, as scientists. I think we're going to be doing a different job in the future than what we're doing now. I can see it all moving clinically. The money stream is going to be coming increasingly from non-NIH things were all probably going to ultimately be owned by drug companies. And that's not necessarily a bad thing either, at least for, for the people in this room, because we're all clinically oriented. So we'll just have to have to see. And um, I don't know. I wish you all good luck. Best of luck. And happy happy pizza consumption. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Thank you so much. Thanks to IPT. <laughs>